Hello, my name is Jacques, and today we're going to continue learning the basics of the Bevy game engine. Bevy is a simple, data-driven game engine built in Rust. It's free and open source. This tutorial is the fourth episode in my Learn Bevy 0.10 video series. This episode builds on what we learned in the previous episodes. Today, we're going to continue with our Bevy ball game project that we've been working on. In today's episode, we'll get our enemies moving around the screen and also add a challenge to avoid the enemies. Before we get started, Rust just had an update to version 1.68 since I started the series. Let's update our Rust version if you're not on the latest version already. With Rust installed, open your terminal and run the rustup update command. This will update Rust on your computer to the latest version. You can check which version you're on by running the cargo version command. Now you can see I'm updated to 1.68. From the Bevy team, Bevy relies heavily on improvements in the Rust programming language and compiler. As a result, the minimum supported Rust version is the latest stable release of Rust. For that reason, we should do our best to keep Rust up to date when working with Bevy. With that out of the way, let's hop back to our code. Let's start by adding a system to make our enemies move around the screen. First, at the top of our file, let's add another public constant. We're going to be using this enemy speed variable in our enemy movement system. Notice our enemies are going to be a bit slower than the player. First, let's make an adjustment to our enemy component. We're going to add some data to our enemy component. We're going to add a public direction of type vec2. This will allow the enemy to keep track of which direction it's moving in. Next, we're going to need to make an adjustment to our spawn enemy function to fill in this data. Here in our spawn enemies function, where we add the enemy component, we need to give it an initial direction. We'll do this by setting the direction component to a vec2, and similarly to how we got our random numbers up here, we're just going to give this direction vector a random x value and a random y value, and then we're going to normalize that vector. Next, let's get started on our enemy movement system. Go to the bottom of your file. We're going to call our system enemy movement. Let's start with a mutable query to get our enemies transforms. For our query types here, we're going to need both the transform and the enemy component to read its direction. Remember, if we want more than one component in our query, we're going to need to wrap them in a tuple. First, we want a mutable transform reference and a reference to the enemy component. For our second system parameter, we're going to need to look at the time resource. In the body of our function, let's start with the for loop to iterate on our query. Here we get a mutable reference to the transform and the enemy component. Let's create a local variable for the enemy's current direction. We're going to make this a vec3, even though our enemy direction is a vec2, just to make the transform math a little easier. For this vec3, we set the x to be the enemy direction.x, the y to be the direction.y, and we leave our z at 0. Next, we need to move the enemy. This is essentially identical to how we move our player. On the enemy's transform.translation, we add the following. First, we take our direction, we multiply it by our enemy speed variable that we have above, and then lastly, we multiply it by time.delta seconds to get smooth, frame rate independent movement. And that's the end of the enemy movement system. It's quite simple. Don't forget we need to register the system with our app now, and we want this system to run once per frame, so we're going to use add system. Let's cargo run our application now. Note, if this is the first time you're running your application since updating Rust, it might go a little slower on the first compile. If we cargo run now, we see our enemies, but they immediately go off the screen, so let's fix that. We need to create another system that will update the enemy direction once they hit the edge of the window to get a sort of bounce back effect. First, we want to add another constant to the top of our file. Just like we had with the player size, we're also going to need to keep track of our enemy size. Just like our player, this one's also 64 pixels by 64 pixels. Let's get to work on the system. At the bottom of our file, add the following system. Update enemy direction. Let's start with our system parameters. Similar to our enemy movement system, our first query is going to be one to the enemy query. Again, we're going to need both the transform and the enemy components, so we wrap them in a tuple. This time, however, we're not changing the transform, but we are going to be changing the enemy component because we want to update the direction. So we need a mutable reference to the enemy component. For our second system parameter, we're going to need to get information on our window width and height, so we'll add a window query. In the body of our function, let's start by getting access to the window. Next, let's calculate what our minimum and maximum x and y values are going to be. This is very similar to the code we wrote in our player confinement system. 
This time, however, we need to do it on all the enemies. So let's start by iterating on our enemy query. In the body of our for loop here, first we want to get the current enemy's translation. Remember, the translation is just the current vector 3 indicating the position. Now we want to check if the translation is out of the bounds we wrote. We're just going to simply flip the direction by multiplying by negative 1 for that specific axis. Let's start with x. If the x position is out of bounds, we're going to flip it by multiplying by negative 1. And same for the y. Now, let's register our system with our app. Cargo run now. And we see that our enemies bounce around the screen. Right now, there's a small bug in our code where on some runs, a ball can get, or rather an enemy can get stuck on the edge of the screen. Let's fix this by adding a system to confine the enemies inside the window, just like we did with the player. At the bottom of our file, let's add a confined enemy movement system. Note, this system is going to be very similar to the confined player movement system, although here we're going to have to iterate through all our enemies. Consider this an exercise if you want to try implementing this yourself. Let's continue. For our system parameters, we're going to need to start by adding an enemy query. We need a mutable reference to the transform, and we don't care about looking at the direction, so we can just use a with filter here to make sure we're getting the enemy entities. Next, we're going to need a window query to get the window width and height. As we've seen before, we start by getting a reference to the window from the window query. Next, let's calculate minimum x and y values. And then let's start by iterating on our enemy query. Let's start by creating a local variable to the current translation. Let's check if the current x position is out of bounds, and if it is, we'll set it back to the minimum or maximum values. We're going to do the same thing with the y. And then finally, set the enemy's transform translation to this translation we just changed. Don't forget we need to register the system with our app. We also want this to run once per frame, so we use add system. Our main function now looks like this. And if we cargo run now, we'll see that the balls stay perfectly. We'll see that the enemies stay perfectly within the window. A quick note on the Rust compiler. The warnings can be really helpful at looking at things you want, might want to fix to keep your code clean. Here we can see on line 186, the compiler is telling us these parentheses are unnecessary, so let's go remove them. Ah, they're here in the for loop I wrote. Since we're just looking at one component, we don't need those parentheses. Next, let's get to work on our first sound effect. We're going to go to our update enemy direction system, and in here, we're going to add two more system parameters. First, the audio resource, which is provided by Bevy to play audio files, and then also the asset server resource to load our audio files. Let's go down to our for loop here. Let's add this direction changed bool to keep track of this enemy to see if its direction has changed. Inside these two if statements, we'll set the direction change to true. Now, still inside this for loop, but at the bottom, let's play a sound effect if the direction did change. Let's create an if direction change block. Let's start by loading in two sound effects using the asset server. Next, let's randomly pick one using the rand function again. Remember, this gives us a value between 0 and 1, so checking if it's greater than 0 0.5 is essentially just doing a coin flip. We do this to select one of the sounds. Now that we have a sound we want to play, we simply do audio.play and our sound effect. Cargo run now. And you can hear the enemies bouncing off the walls. These sound effects might get a little annoying, so feel free to comment out that code or swap in some other sound effects that you prefer. I think a squishier sound effect would work better here, but these are the ones we have for now. Next, we're going to start adding in a challenge. We're going to make a system to simulate the enemies colliding with the player. In many games, we can do this using physics, but we're going to keep things simple for this tutorial and simply detect if two entities are touching by how close or far they are from one another. 
We'll take a look at working with physics in Bevy in the future, but for now, we're just going to calculate the distance between each enemy and the player to do a sort of pseudo physics simulation. At the bottom of our file, let's start on our system. Let's call it enemy hit player. We're going to need a couple of different system parameters for this system. Let's start with commands. We're going to use commands to despawn the player if the player gets hit by an enemy. Next, we're going to need a player query. Inside our query, we're going to need two things, so let's wrap them in a tuple. First is something we haven't seen before, which is the entity itself. Notice I'm not using a reference here or a mutable reference, but just straight the enemy. We can do this because entity is just a U32. Because it's a U32, we can just copy it around. For the second argument of our tuple here, we're going to want to look at the player's transform. So we're just going to get a reference to the transform. With the two components we want, although entity isn't a component, it's the entity. Next, we want to make sure we're getting the player, so we add a width filter. Next, we're going to need our enemies as well, so let's add an enemy query. We're just going to want to look at the transform, and nothing's going to be mutable. So notice we don't have a mutable statement at the beginning here, and we can just use a filter to make sure we're getting the enemy components. Next, we're also going to want a sound effect for when the player gets hit by an enemy, so let's add our asset server resource and the audio resource. Remember, they're both provided by Bevy. With that, let's get started on the body of our system. We're going to start with another if let ok block to get the player entity and transform. Remember, because this is a tuple, we're going to need a tuple inside our ok statement here. The first argument is going to be the player entity, and the next one's going to be the player transform. We're going to get these from player query dot get single mutt. Remember, get single mutt gives us the result type which has either t, what we want, or e, an error. And here, t is the tuple that holds the entity and the reference to the transform. Let's start working inside our if let ok block now that we have the player entity and the player transform. Next, we're going to want to iterate on our enemy query to look at each enemy transform. Notice, here we're just using iter and not iter mutt because we're just looking at the transform, and this isn't a mutable query. Let's start by getting the distance from the player transform to the enemy transform. Translation has a handy distance method for us to use here. And with that, we have the distance between the current enemy and the player. Next, we're going to need to determine if the enemy and the player are touching. So we're going to need two local variables, the player radius as well as the enemy radius. We can get these easily from our player size and enemy size constants. If the distance is less than the sum of these two radius, it means the two entities are touching. In that case, let's print out game over, let's load the explosion sound effect, let's play the explosion sound effect, and then lastly, something we haven't seen before, is we're going to despawn an entity. To do this, we use the entity method on commands. We pass in the player entity. That's why it was important to get this player entity from the player query. And then lastly, we call the despawn method. Let's register the system with our app now. We want this to run once per frame to perform collision detection. Cargo run now. Cargo run now. And now, in our game, oh, if we get hit, there's the sound effect that plays. And in the console, we see enemy hit player, game over. That brings us to the end of episode four. We've covered adding an enemy movement system, adding sound effects, doing pseudo collision detection, and despawning our player. We've also looked at many more examples of ECS and queries. Still to come are bevy events, using timers, UI, states, fixed time steps, and many more examples. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope you're enjoying this series. Please let me know down in the comments how you're doing. If you have any questions, please feel free to give me feedback on the pacing and the content. And again, thanks for watching.